I'm going to have a word of prayer. Okay, well, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, for your Torah, Father, for you being so generous and loving to us that you've committed yourself to your word, that, Lord, that uh, we have a direction that we can go in. Father, but that what you, you show us in your Torah, you explain everything that's not only in the past and the present, but the future, and that, Lord, we can have a better understanding of it so that we can live uh, more productive and abundant lives. And bless these people here tonight, Father, that their ears are open in their hearts, that they might learn something new that they've never heard before they can apply to their lives. In Yeshua's name, amen. Okay, before we get going here, this is a slight review. I know for those of you that are here for the, for the first time or you're new to El Shaddai, of course, we're a teaching ministry to teach the Hebrew roots of our Christian faith, and uh, that's what this is all about. So... Um, you're, you're in the right place at the beginning because we're kind of at the beginning of things here. Now, the notes, as I go through this, a lot of the notes will go along right directly with what I say, although I'm going to deviate. There's a lot of other things that I'm going to bring up as well. Uh, but it, I've, we, we made it this way purposely so it would be easier for you to follow. Okay, so here we go. Are you ready? And it's, it's, no, uh, it's no coincidence that what we're teaching, we're sharing here, what we've been sharing for a number of, for a long time now, is that what we share about Torah and what we share about the Word is very a present thing that's happening about Israel. And this was just in the news just the other day. It was actually, it came out, I don't know if it's on regular news, but it says in a final statement of a two-week conference, Bishop Sanad said, biblical concept of promised land cannot be used to justify settlements. Israel cannot use the biblical concept of a promised land or a chosen people to justify new settlements in Jerusalem or territorial claims, the Vatican Synod said on the Middle East, said on Saturday. You know, this is a very present thing that's happening uh, right now, uh, which is, is very, very alarming uh, to basically uh, nullify that the Bible, saying that the Bible is, doesn't hold any water when it comes to Israel building settlements. And many of you know or may not know that Israel can't build a deck on a house without permission from the State Department of the U.S. And our daughter told us um, when we spoke to her uh, last week, they were in that uh, military, um, they were in that military camp that Jacob Schreiberman, who was here this past summer, uh, they're IDF special forces, and they spoke to several of these IDF. They went on the base. This is Pastor Mark's group. My daughter was there. And the soldiers are saying that the Arab settlements said just keep building and building and building on Israeli land. But they never, you never hear any about that in the news. You just hear about freezing the settlements, which means they can't build a deck on their house without permission of the U.S. Uh, State Department. But yet here the Vatican even comes forward and says now the Bible is, it doesn't validate settlements. So it's very alarming because we're seeing prophecy unfold. It's incredible. And it all comes down to, it's, it all comes down to Israel. It comes down to God's people. In fact, if, you, if you're able to find the website, which I had it, the further dialogue on this basically says that, that the, the statement chosen people doesn't even hold any water. Okay, it's on, yeah, watch that, but, but that, that term doesn't even, hold, doesn't even hold true. That's very, very alarming. Okay, so that just, that's a good thing. Here's why, because that just means prophecies unfolding before our eyes. Praise God. So let's get into the word tonight. <laughs> oh, in Psalm 119.97, and we're going to talk a little bit about law tonight, not legalism. It says, oh, how I love thy law. And in Psalm 119, as many of you know or may not know, uh, every verse in Psalm 119 has, has some word in it that refers to the ordinances, the commandments, or the statutes of God in every verse in Psalm 119. And David says here, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. In Psalm 1 it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit into season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper." Now, in Romans chapter 7, in the New Testament, wherefore the law is holy, the commandment is holy and just and good. 
There's a city that's in the southernmost part of Russia that's called Durbant, and it's often identified with uh, what's called the legendary Gates of Alexander. And it, it, Dur this city of Durban claims to be the oldest city in Russia. The, uh, the Gates of Alexander was a, a legendary barrier that was built by the Caucasus Mountains like up against the Caspian Sea, and it was to keep uncivilized barbarians of the south um, from invading the land to the south. Now, when, of course, when there was a dispersion from Jerusalem in the Book of Acts, and the, the Jews were dispersed all throughout the region and, and through the centuries known as the dispersion. Uh, the people started to come back and to migrate to other lands, and Russia was one of those lands. And there was a group that, uh, that came, two different groups of Jews that came and settled in Durban, and they built synagogues, and the synagogues were facing each other on opposite sides of the same street. So you have a synagogue on, on uh, the opposite sides of the, uh, of the street, okay, facing in different directions. And as some of you know, that when Jews pray, and this is the way synagogues are set up, they pray facing Jerusalem. Okay, if you're with a Jew and you're going to pray, they'll face Jerusalem to wh where that is. For us, that would be due east, south, east, if you have a GPS. Okay, so these were built on opposite sides of the street. And what that meant was when it was set up is that one, one group in one synagogue prayed one way in one direction and the other group prayed the other way. So the two communities that started out in Jerusalem a long time before now point their members in opposite directions to pray and to serve God. And that's the way many churches are today. Uh, if truth is determined only by human decrees, then there's nothing further that we have to talk about tonight. Then truth would just be relative to culture. And that's why you hear people say, well, it, we have to change with the times. The only thing is God makes it very clear. I'm the Lord, I change not. Okay? So it's not based on human decrees. But if, if the truth is not determined by human degree, decrees and actions that are over time, then it becomes legitimate to explore the conflict that we hear about between the Old Testament and what's known as Torah. In Joshua 22, verse 5, it says and this, this is on your notes, but take diligent heed, and this is in Joshua after they've come into the promised land, take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses the servant of the Lord charged you to love. This is the purpose, to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart and with all, all your soul. And in Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. In Leviticus 8, 19, verse 18, But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Has anything changed? Has God changed his directive on this? This is the directives that Moses and Joshua gave to the children of Israel. In fact, Jesus, or Yeshua, and those of you that are new, if you hear me say Yeshua, that's the Hebrew name for Jesus, in Matthew 22, 37, and he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first, the great and first commandment. And the second's like to it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend. Now, depending on what version that you have, there's different versions. I'll just tell you what the Greek word is that, that's there. But this particular version, which is the revised standard version, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. God makes it very clear that we're to love him and then to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. See? So he hasn't changed in light of that. It's the Greek word kremenumi, which means to hang or to suspend when you suspend on something. Okay? So to love the Lord your God, you need to suspend on, on, on Torah, basically. And Jesus said in, in Matthew 5, verse 17, uh, Think not that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And the word destroy is, a, is another Greek, this Greek word, and you'll hear me talk about some Greek because we're in the New Testament. It's kataluo. Kata, the word kata, this part of this word kataluo in Greek, a lot of times there are these prepositions, uh, and, and kata means down. It means to bring down. And, and Jesus said, I haven't come to bring down, to, to bring down the law. I've come to fulfill it. And the word fulfill means, it's a word play ra'o, 
which is a word that's used in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came. It means to, 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 to fill it to capacity. I've come to fulfill it to capacity, to, to accomplish it, because the children of Israel had gotten so far away from, from Torah, he was the living Torah. He had come to fulfill, to show them what God had really intended for them through Torah. So, see, Yeshua came to empower, he came to empower people, to love people, to, to love God and to love others. That's why people who love God can say in, in Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. You see, there's always been teachings over by the centuries by the church that, that, that have been backwards, but it wasn't always that way. But through the centuries, and, and as I mentioned last week when I went through the church fathers as a, after the first century, the first, second, third, fourth century, and I talked about Marcion, and I talked about the apologists and so on, and after a while they just began in the New Testament and then backwards to the Tanakh, to approach the scriptures. Well, historically, the followers of Yeshua, particularly Jews, because at Pentecost, all of the ones, all that were in Jerusalem at that time were Jews because it was a feast of Shavuot or Pentecost. And so they didn't accept any teaching that they just heard, but they tested it against what God already gave to Israel at Sinai, which was the Torah. See, the new had to be measured by the truth that God had already given. You remember in the book of Acts with the Bereans, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they searched the scriptures daily, that those things were so? What scriptures did they search? They searched the Torah. So interpreting the Bible backwards can produce a message that's backwards. Beginning at the end can obscure the beginning. It can trivialize all history that doesn't fit with the present. That's why when people say, well, it doesn't hold any water, or, it's, it, you know, we have to change with the times is because they don't respect the integrity of how God committed himself to his word. See, Revelation might be the last, the last book in the Bible, but what is it that's being concluded? You know, and why is the book of Revelation so, such a puzzle to so many people? Well, part of the foundation of what we teach at El Shaddai is about the Feast of the Lord, and the Feast of the Lord it gives a big prophetic picture of what the book of Revelation is all about. But if you throw away Torah and you say, well, I can't, uh, that's already done away with, or I don't, you know, we don't need to learn that, then you're throwing away what brings the understanding of what the book of Revelation is all about. And many of you have seen that. So how can any, anybody know that the New Testament is what it claims to be? How can anybody know that Yeshua or Jesus is the Messiah? And so any claim to authenticity has to be based on what is already acknowledged to be true. See, in Revelation 19.10, it says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Some of you may be thinking, what, what, does, that really, what does that really mean? Well, the angel was dictating with John, and John was writing this down. And they were both on the same mission because they were both sent. So the testimony of Jesus can be taken either objectively, that it was a testimony concerning him, or that uh, subjectively that the testimony was sent by him. Okay, so that's what it's talking about as far as the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All prophecy in the Bible concerns Jesus one way or the other anyway. He's the subs sum and substance of all of it from Genesis to Revelation. He himself is the prophet. He is prophecy. Now, remember last week we talked about the law, the prophet, and the Psalms, right? And how could someone get to know Jesus? How could somebody get to know Messiah? Did, did, do you need to have the New Testament, right? Well, in John chapter 1, in verse 45, you remember when, when Jesus was just beginning to bring his disciples together, his apostles, right? And he had witnessed to the, some of these guys in Galilee. Well, he comes to Philip. He finds Nathanael, and he says to him, now catch this, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. They acknowledged that they had found the Messiah, but because they knew the scriptures, they knew Torah, and Torah pointed to Yeshua. And that's what, they, that's what they said. It wasn't any other thing written after that 
They came it because they knew that Messiah was coming. They knew the character and the attributes of Messiah, and, they, and that's what he said. We found him. They recognized something that he was saying, that he was doing, that, that pointed to him as being the Messiah. The foundation of Jesus' teaching was the Tanakh. The foundation of Paul's teaching was the Tanakh. In Acts chapter 24, in verse 14, and this is Paul as he's giving one of his discourses, he says, so worship I the God of my fathers. This is the Apostle Paul, or Rabbi Shaul, however you want to say it, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. Okay, so Paul didn't say, well, I believe some of those things, you know, I have to leave some of those other things out, but I believe some of them. He said, no, he believed all, believed all that was written in the law and the prophets. In Acts 28, 23, and when they had appointed him a day, he's talking about Rabbi Shaul or Apostle Paul, there came many to him in his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of what? The law of Moses and the prophets from morning until evening. You know, so you, there's really no way you can back off and say, well, it didn't hold any water. It seemed to hold water for the Apostle Paul. He seemed to think it had some integrity to it. What it means to be related to the people of Israel and the connection to the land is all laid out in the Torah. It's the primary source for learning about Israel. That's why if you want to follow the news, like the clip that I just had read to you or whatever else you hear in the news, and sometimes the things that you hear in the news don't always line up because the, the media doesn't always report it in, in favor of Israel. You know, and that's why I think many of you will be surprised when the group comes back to tell you what's really happening over in Israel right now and, and what the sentiment is and where people are at and, and how the media is reporting things. But if you want to understand Israel today and what's going on and what's going to happen, it's all laid out in the Torah and how it relates to us. In Romans chapter 9, verse 4, it says, They are Israelites. To them belong the sonship, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and of their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ. Because Yeshua, Jesus, came out of the, from the tribe of Judah. He was, he was a Jew. He was a child of Israel. So the Torah is, is not that it's the law, but it contains God's teaching and instruction. Now, it should be on your notes here. And, and those of you here that, uh, as we followed through with the Hebrew class tonight, you know a little bit about roots now, right? So if you see a Hebrew word and then there's three letters in there, it actually, or part of it shows the root. Once you begin to know the roots, you can know all of the other Hebrew words. It's getting a little more complicated now. You're only in the third session of this Hebrew class. But you can say Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> so you can go to work tomorrow and say, hey, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> and then you can show them the letters. Torah is uh, Torah in the Hebrew. The root word is Yara. And you can see that part of that root that's in there in your notes. And it means to throw, like especially an arrow, to shoot, to, to uh, figuratively to point out as aiming the finger or to teach. It also means teaching or instruction, to hit the mark concerning God. You know, so if you get a picture of a bullseye, you know, hitting the mark would be, that, that's what Torah is, to hit the mark with God. So the opposite of hitting the mark would be to miss the mark, which is sin. And sin is the Hebrew word kata, which means to miss, and figuratively or generally to sin or to lead something astray <clears throat> so that you don't hit the mark. Well, when we talk about the New Testament, and, and again, as I mentioned last week, Marcion in 144 was the one that came up with his version of the, the New Testament, and he left out uh, many of the books in the, that, were in the, that we know are the epistles that are in the New Testament today, and he had his own version saying that the Old Testament was the God of wrath and the New Testament's the God of love, and that thought carried on over a period of time, and a lot of people bought it. 
But the meaning of the new, new covenant or the New Testament in Hebrew is actually is known as Berit Hadashah. And this is actually confirmed in Hebrews, <clears throat> well, first in Jeremiah 31.31. 31. And I think you have it on your notes. It says, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Now this is the, the, the expression of the new covenant in, in Jeremiah 31, but it's also confirmed in Hebrews chapter 10. This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. So the word new is Kadesh. And covenant is Brit, which is a compact. It means compact or an agreement. Uh, it's, it's made by passing between two pieces of flesh. It comes from Genesis 15, 17, when uh, Abraham uh, was in a deep sleep and the Lord had an encounter with him. Uh, and there was a, a sacrifice that was cut up. And it, came to, it says it in Genesis 15, 17, it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And in that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, unto thy seed have I given this, this land, given thee this land. And so that's what it's talking about here. That's what, the, what uh, the covenant was. It was the passing between the pieces, and the Lord made an agreement with him. Now here's what's really important to understand here, because this is really sensitive terminology that people, uh, that, that, makes, that makes a backwards theology, to start from the back and then work, you know, work backwards. The corresponding word in the New Testament for law is the word nomos. So, if we're, which I'll talk about this in a minute because I'm going to show it to you after you've heard me talk about the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. And that word nomos is, is, corresponds to the same word law in the Old Testament or the Tanakh. So when we're referring to law, it's referring to the Torah. Okay? The only way that they translated it when they did the translation in the New for the New Testament from the different texts, the Stephen's text and so on, they called, they called it law. They didn't call it Torah. But in the Tanakh, it's Torah. But in the New Testament, they called it law. Okay? And so many times, and I know that I did, because when I, when I was young, and I, I'd mentioned this before, I went to parochial school, and legalism was a big deal. Say the wrong thing, stand up in the room, put out your hand, here comes the ruler. Look at, the, look at the teacher the wrong way, your head gets banged into a closet. Go through eight years of that, and you had enough of it. And so I had two Jewish guys that witnessed to me when I was, when I was 19, when I was working at a Jewish hospital, and witnessed to me about the Bible, and I'd never seen a Bible before. And they talked about law, they talked about grace and love, and then they showed me Roman, and, and this, this guy came to me, I was working on the floor, he came up to me and he said, I thought he was on drugs. This drugs seemed to float around the hospitals pretty well, and I, that's what I thought, he was, looked like he was really high, and I said, what's with you? And he, sa he says, oh, I got saved. I said, cut it out. He says, no, I got saved. And he opened up this Bible, which I'd never seen before because we weren't allowed to look at a Bible. Okay. And he opened it up and he looked here into Romans chapter 10. And he said, look at this, wrote verse 9. It says, if you confess Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And, and the, the words kind of just came off. Of, I never saw that before. All that schooling, and then, how come I never saw that? Because I always thought I was going to hell, you know. By the time I walked out of the back of the church after a confession, I had a black spots all over my soul all over again. I had to turn around and go back, you know, one, one week after the next. And so to look at that and to see, and then he explained to me who Jesus was and God's love, and God loves you. I never heard that one before. So legalism was something that had been rampant, at least in my day, you know, it was rampant. You can talk to Pastor Mark, he'll tell you the same thing. And that's how I saw 
God. It was legalism. Don't do this, don't do that. In Romans chapter 3, verse 9, and I think we're before that here, the word for sin actually in the New Testament, well, wait a minute, I'll back up here. The word for law is nomos. The word for lawlessness is anomos. It's just that there's an A in front of it, and it means lawlessness. It means without law. In Romans 3, verse 9, it says, For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. Okay, Jews and Gentiles, that means you if you're not a Jew. Okay, if you weren't born a Jew, you're a Gentile. You can't get out of that. That's just the way the nomenclature goes. They're all under sin. As it is written, there's none righteous, not one. In Psalm 14, 3, they've all gone aside. They've all together become filthy. There's none that does good, no, not one. Well, what about Gentiles? For it's not the hearers of the law who are just in the eyes of God. It's those who obey the Torah who will be acquitted. In Romans 2.15, when it talks about the Gentiles, and I believe this is on your notes, the verses, it's important that you look at this one. This is from, I think, the complete Jewish Bible. When Gentiles who have no law obey instinctively the law's requirements, they're a law to themselves, even though they have no law. They exhibit the effect of the law that's written on their hearts. Their conscience bears them witness as their mortal convictions accuse or it may defend them. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means basically it's a juggling act. Bring up that PowerPoint. You know, you have the Gentiles here, and, and they, don't, they don't have a law. So their law is their conscience, depending on their culture, their background, their upbringing. So they would say, oh, is this the right thing to do? Or they might say, well, maybe I'll do this. Or that can't be right. So they're just kind of, they're, they're juggling thoughts back and forth. Well, I don't know if I should do this. Should I do that? Should I do this? Is this right? Is this wrong? Because they don't really have a law. They don't have any boundaries. So what do they become? They become a law unto themselves. And that's basically what we have today. In fact, a lot of the laws that are on record are laws unto themselves made up by politicians, although there's a basis and a standard for it. You know, should we do this? Should we do that? And that's what law becomes. And some believe that the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament, from Genesis to Malachi, is the law of Moses. Right? When the law of Moses, when we're referring to that, we're really referring to Torah, which is Genesis through Deuteronomy. Martin Luther, in his commentary on Galatians, he said, Christ has, a, Martin Luther said this, Christ has abolished all the laws of Moses that ever were. Okay, Martin Luther said that. Well, what if this was true, right? Well, then there would be no laws against murder, theft, adultery, and so on. Then what? Right, and that's kind of where we're headed today. With a lot, you, you can't really tell it. The lines are so blurred. Lawlessness begins to abound, and people don't know what their boundaries are anymore. You know, what's right in one place is wrong in another place. Well, what about the Jews? Well, put the, if we can bring that PowerPoint up. The Jews are upholding Torah. They look at what the 613 mitzvahs are, and also the 10 words, which you know is the 10 commandments. So they have it. I read those verses earlier, right from Romans. It was given to them. So in traditional Hebrew thinking, and this is on your notes, they considered Torah, what, what Jewish people today consider, consider Torah is all authoritative teachings of rabbis. I'm saying this is what they consider Torah. All law in the Bible and the Talmud, with the Talmud, which is a commentary on Torah. The Tanakh, which is Genesis through Malachi. It's, it's known as the Tanakh. And the first five books of the Bible, which is known as the Kumash, Genesis through Deuteronomy. They consider Torah being given at the covenant on Mount Sinai. And any teaching of the first five books, whether it's written or it's oral. Now, this is, we have this in our bookstore. This is a Kumash. And what it is, it's Genesis through Deuteronomy. It has the Hebrew, and it has the, it has the, uh, the English as well, and it also has commentary by the sages. This is what's known as the Kumash. 
It's a good resource. Is it, is it right all of the time? Some of the time, the co it's commentary, but it has a lot of great historical value to it, and it has the Hebrew, which is the original ancient language. But, see, the rabbis claim that the oral law, when Moses was at Sinai, when he went up to the mount to bring the Ten Commandments, they also believe that Moses also had the oral law, that God gave him law that he, uh, or commandments that he gave orally that weren't written down. They weren't written down, in fact, until some 200 CE, com the Common Era or AD, of which we finally have the Talmud. We have the Mishnah, which is a commentary on the Talmud, and then you have the Gemara, which is another commentary. Okay, so those are all commentaries. But the Torah is the Word of God. So then, sin is considered to be lawlessness. And that's with basically without teaching. The thing is, is that Torah is not at loggerheads with grace. We know that there was grace in the Torah because Noah found grace. Grace is all through the Old Testament. But Torah functions as the guide. Torah is the guide. In Romans chapter 3, verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So how do we find out then? How do we find out what lawlessness is? Well, it's by the Torah. The Torah shows us what's, what's off and what's on. See? By the law is the knowledge of sin. In Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. I wouldn't have known what sin was except by the law, by the Torah. So the Torah is what points it out when you're off the track. And I'm going to show you that here from the New Testament, also from the Torah. So what eases the mind in this situation, because we're dealing with translations, is that when you're reading the New Testament and it says law, it's talking about Torah. And the Torah is what leads us to Jesus or to Yeshua. In Galatians chapter 3, in verse 24, it says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to, unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So the justification comes by faith. The father of our faith is Abraham. Okay? Because Abraham wasn't justified because of the deeds that he did, but because he believed what God told him. That's the basis for, this, for these verses in Galatians and in Romans, is because of Abraham's faith. Well, the schoolmaster, is the, this is a Greek word that you may have, may have heard or may not have heard, but it's actually, a, it has a Hebrew background. If we could bring up this PowerPoint. And a schoolmaster is the Greek word uh, pedagogos. It's not a teacher, and it's not a tutor. This schoolmaster or this pedagogos was somebody who followed the young in the household around to keep him out of trouble and to ensure that the student was safely on his way to the teacher. So that's what this schoolmaster is referring to for us it brought us along, it made sure that we were going in the direction that we were supposed to be going, right? And that's what God did for the Jewish people, to make sure that they were going along. Torah brought them along to point them to Christ. And I showed that on Saturday, I showed it last week, as far as the types of the Messiah, and it showed that with Isaac, and it's all through the Torah like that, right from Genesis chapter 1. So Torah pursued us, and it kept the children of Israel out of trouble. Now in Galatians 3.23, the verse before that, it says, before faith came, and here it's talking about the faith of Jesus Christ. Before faith came, we were kept under the law. We were shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. That word kept there, it's the word frueo in Greek, and it means to be a watcher in advance. To, to mount guard as a sentinel, to, to hem in or to protect. So the Torah is what protected us until Yeshua came. It protected us. 
It shut us up, meaning it's enclosed. It's like the, the Torah, it's, it has a protective function to it, to protect and to preserve the mental, the moral, and the social society, safety of the environment into which one is born until the date that's set by the Father. And that's in Galatians chapter 4, verse 1, and this is really exciting. Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but he's under tutors and governors, until the time appointed of the Father, the time when the Spirit leads them to Messiah. And that's why I say, I mean, I, I, how could you go through all religious training and so on, and all of a sudden one day somebody comes to you and speaks a word of truth, and that's the day God connects with you. Because it's the time appointed. You were kept all this time, what, however that was, to lead you to Yeshua. See, God only knows what your heart is. He knows when the time is right. So you can't, you can't pounce on somebody to receive before the time. It's that, you know, you, you see all the bumper stickers, we f I found Jesus. You didn't find nothing. He found you. Okay, and it says this is the proof of it right here. Until his appointed time. Well, what about Israel in the book? In Romans chapter 3, verse 1, and this is from the Aramaic New Testament. Okay, well, I think we have one of those back there, which, is, I, which I recommend to those of you that would like to read an accurate um, version of the New Testament. What then is the superiority of the Jew? Who would think of such a thing? In the, when I, when I was, first started reading the Bible, I was in college, and I never, as I said, I never had a Bible. And, and I was in engineering class. And we'd sit at these benches that had the backs up because they had these outlets you can plug stuff into. And so when I, got, when I phased out on the professor, I'd open the Bible up because it was, it was fan, to me it was fantastic. I'd never see everything was new to me. I never saw it before. I'd open it up. And he'd be doing his thing and I'd be reading the Bible and, you know, and, and so I'd come across these verses and I'd put the circle, circles around them. I don't, I don't understand this, I don't understand it. And I didn't understand, this is a verse, I didn't understand it. And then one day the professor called me and said, I need to talk to you after class. So I went back in his office and said, it's a good thing to read the good book, but when you're in my class, you read my book. I said, all right, fair enough. <laughs> in Romans 3.1, what then is the superiority of the Jew? Much in every way. Why? Because first to them, first to them were entrusted the words of Elohim. To them first. Well, what about the Gentiles? Paul says it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, talking about Gentiles, that at the time you were without Christ, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Okay? You weren't part of Israel. You were strangers from the covenants of promise. You had no hope and you were without God in the world, okay? So I don't care what people, Gentiles say, you know, which God, there's, there's all kinds of gods out there. The God we're talking about, Elohim, and the creator of the heavens and the earth, Paul made it real clear that it was to the Jew first, to them were committed the oracles of God. They were entrusted with the words first. The Gentiles were aliens from the commonwealth. They were not part of the covenants. It was the Jews that had the covenants. We, the Gentiles, were grafted in with them. We were grafted in because of the blood of Yeshua, because of his death and resurrection. So you got in under, you know, you got in under the wire, so to speak, because you had to operate the faith of Abraham and believe that what God said he promised and that he is willing and able. Romans chapter 4. So brought, Paul brought to light to non-Jews what their shortcomings were. Basically that you're dead. See, that's what he, he was, you know, there's no, you, there's no life without Jesus Christ. Well, what about the Jews? In Amos chapter 3, verse 2, God says to Amos, he says, you only, talking to, and he's referring to the Jewish people, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. He called the Jewish people out first. And as we know, those of you that have been in the Torah studies through the years, he didn't pick Israel because they were so great. He said, all the other nations are wickeder than you are. <laughs> right? 
but also because of the faith of one man, Abraham, of whom came from his loins the children of Israel and all of us. Well, then what was the, the evangelical pattern? Well, to be saved, we have to be a part of God's covenant family. Who's God's covenant family? It's Israel. So we identify with Israel in a very big way. Israel is not somebody that's dissolved or disappeared. Israel is following prophecy just as it's supposed to be somewhat even to their own ignorance. Because a lot of Israel today, there are a, lot of, a lot of them are secular atheists. They just knew to come back into the land because the land be had belonged to them. And so now they're back and they're fulfilling prophecy. First the physical, then the spiritual. Well, the Torah is also known as the Ketubah. And a ketubah is a sacred and it's a legal marriage document and it sets forth the conditions upon which a marriage is established and the conditions to make it a happy one. And this happened at Sinai after they came out from Egypt, after God, Moses, after Moses led them out of Egypt and into the promised land. And at that point at Sinai, which corresponds on our calendars, as you know, it is Pentecost. It's also the Feast of Shavuot, it's known as in Hebrew. That's when God gave the law or the Torah to Moses to give to the children of Israel. At that time, he made with Israel a ketubah. He redeemed them when he brought them out of Egypt. Now he brings them into the land, and he says, now we're going to make an agreement. Moses brings the words down to the children of Israel, and here's what the children of Israel say. In Exodus 19.8, All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. That's the signature of the marriage contract of the ketubah. So Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And so it was sealed. That was the marriage covenant between Elohim and the children of Israel. Now, I want to return here where some of this I left off last week because this is really important. I want you to see this. And it's in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. If you remember, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, I know some of you weren't here last week, but if you have your notes, those of you were here, this word, scripture here, is the word graphe, which means, it means scriptures, it means collectively the Torah and all other inspired works, okay, meaning the, the Tanakh, okay, inspired works. And where it talks about in the verses before that with Timothy, it says, from a child, you knew that you learned the Holy Scriptures. That's the word grama, which is referring specifically to Torah. So Timothy grew up on Torah. All Scripture given by inspiration of God includes Torah and all collection of all other inspired, the prophets and the Psalms and so on. Okay? Now, here's the thing about what about all Scripture? Well, it's, it's profitable, number one, for doctrine or for teaching, which means how to believe rightly. Now, I want to show you here, because you've heard me talk about this. The Septuagint is a Greek translation of the, of, uh, the Old Testament or the Tanakh. You can't really see this, but you're going to see it in a minute. This is a Septuagint, okay? It just has the, it has the Greek text. And it has the English, or if you get a Septuagint that's an interlinear, you can see the Hebrew words in the Old Testament in Greek that will correspond with New Testament words. Okay? It's very helpful to find out, well, how does this word correspond in the, in the Tanakh or the Old Testament in the Greek? What's the word? Okay? To do that properly, it's helpful to have a concordance to the Septuagint. And I'm going to show you this up here in a minute. That's a concordance. You can't see anything in here yet. I've got 10 minutes to show you this. Okay. Following me so far? Okay. Bring up that PowerPoint. Please. <laughs> Second Timothy 3.16 from the Septuagint, which is the Torah in Greek. The word, all scripture, is profitable for doctrine or teaching, which is the Greek word now. It's called, it's the didaskalia. And this is the Greek word right here. Now, this here is from the Septuagint, okay, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. This is Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1. Those of you that know the Hebrew word for Deuteronomy, it's Devarim. 
means these are the words. Okay? Well, here it is right here. And now, O Israel, hear the ordinances. That's that word right there. Now, it varies in some with the, with the, the, the suffix at the end of the word, depending on the tense that it's in, but this is the word, ordinances, is the same as doctrine and teaching. The ordinances and the judgments, as many as I teach, that's the verb form of doctrine or teaching. Okay? So there it is right in the Torah. What is Paul talking about? All scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable for what? Doctrine. Where did he get that from? He got it right from, it's right here in the, in the Torah, and it shows it with the, Greek, New, with the Greek Old Testament. It's right there. Well, what about reproof? What's reproof? And before I go on with that, this is a concordance to the Septuagint. And here you see these are the Greek, this is a Greek word, and then it shows all the occurrences in the Old Testament that that Greek word is used. So that's how you do the correspondence between the two. It helps you to see what those words are. Now, what's reproof? It's the word eglekos. And you can see right here again from Torah, you shall reprove your neighbor and you shall not, you shall not take a, on account of him in sin. So reprove, it means with rebuke. Well, what does reproof mean? Well, it gets our attention when we're off track. If you practice error long enough, it becomes doctrinal error. So when you have doctrine and you get off the track, it, after a while it becomes doctrinal error. So that's what it's talking about in Torah here. You need to rebu rebuke or to reprove to get somebody back on track. Well, then what's the next part of it? Well, you have correction. And correction is the word apanothorsis. And here you can see, this, is, this shows the usage of this word here in the Septuagint. It means, I will return back. Well, how, why would you have to return back unless you were off the track? Okay, so you're following me? This is all from Torah, 2 Timothy 3.16. Doctrine is when you're off. It's the teaching. It's, the, it's the, the teaching and instruction, the judgments of God. The reproof is when you get off the doctrine, right? And then the correction is when you need to come back. Well, when you, do, when you have practical error, you practice error long enough, it becomes doctrinal error. Okay, and then it needs to be corrected. Well, it's interesting that this word correction, it's, it's that Greek word apanathorsis. Anybody that's, that had, knows medical terminology in here, I got eight minutes. It means to set straight what's become twisted. Okay, it's a, it's a medical term. It comes from the medical term orthosis, which is like an orthopedic device which supports or corrects the function of a limb. My son, my youngest, our youngest son, uh, a number of years ago, broke his wrist. And he was pretty young at that time. He was uh, 11, 12 years old. And so they set the wrist, only for us to find out two weeks later, because he had pain, that they set it wrong. Okay? So we have to go back in, do sur the six-hour, four-hour surgery, break the wrist, and then operate from both sides. So we weren't real too happy about that. Okay? But it was to set something that was... It was twisted, it was broken, and had to be reset, okay? So that's what correction is. You practice error long enough, it becomes doctrinal error, okay? So all three of those together, what, what do they come up with? Well, the reason is, is for instruction in righteousness. Bring up that next PowerPoint, which is the word paida. And here it is right here from the Septuagint or from Torah, you shall know today that I do not speak to your children as many as are not knowing, nor knew the instruction of the Lord. That's the word for Lord. This is the word for instruction. Okay, so that whole verse that Paul wrote about in 2 Timothy all came from Torah. Paul didn't just make that up. It shows his, the Hebraic nature. And the reason in 2 Timothy 3.17 is that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The word for perfect is the Greek word artios, and that's another um, medical term. It, 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 it's in the term of being fully equipped, uh, fully furnished. It's also used of a ship that's fully prepared for a voyage, or a wrestler who's sharp on all points, ready for a match. Okay, so that's what scripture, that's what the word is good for. And, and the, the word furnished is the word exartizo, it's a form of that, and it means to fit or to prepare perfectly, 
like a joint, like a ball in a joint that works really smoothly. Now in Malachi 4, verse 4, the Lord says here, Remember you the law of Moses, my servant, whom I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and with the judgments. See, the Torah was given to Israel after they were redeemed for Egypt, which was meant for God's redeemed. So here, if Torah was not to have any impact anymore, why here in Malachi is the Lord telling him, remember the Torah of Moses? In Romans chapter uh, 9, these chapters are about Israel. In verse 31 through 33, it says, uh, But Israel, who ran after the Torah of righteousness, has not found the Torah of righteousness. And why in verse 32? Because they went after it, not by faith, but by the works of Torah. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. See, when Israel followed Moses, and when they were obedient to Yahweh, by faith, they won their battles. But when they rebelled, they lost and they suffered, suffered many casualties. Well, today when Israel seeks Yahweh by faith, they'll find Mashiach. They'll find the Messiah. But where Israel, where the Jews stumble today is when they focus not on faith, but the works of Torah according to religious authorities and traditions. And that doesn't go just for the Jews. Mashiach then becomes to them a stumbling stone. But in verse 33 it says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a stone of offense. He who believes in him will not be ashamed. Because Yeshua is not our stumbling stone. Yeshua is our cornerstone. So why don't we all stand? Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that uh, your word is incredible. Your word is magnificent. Father, that, uh, Father, you've set it in order so that it's so very simple to believe, and it's, it's our hearts and minds that get confused at times, and Lord, we need to be diligent, not only searchers of your word, but also doers of your word. That, Father, that all we learn, we might learn words and meanings of words and concepts, but it all comes down to two things. That's to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor. And, Father, that is the conclusion of the whole Torah, that we be doers of that word. Bless your people here tonight. Bless Pastor Mark and all those in Israel. Protect them. Father, we'll all be reunited this Saturday on your Shabbat, in Yeshua's name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom.